but no worries. Okay. okay. So go uh, ahead. Yeah, I'll just start with mine. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, if you are not sure who I am, my name is John from the University of Glasgow. Uh, and today uh, I'm going to talk to you about transfer learning, which is a topic that is related to deep learning that Andrew spoke about uh, at the last webinar. Uh, so hopefully it will be something that you might be able to, uh, something that won't be too difficult to uh, grasp. Uh, so uh, I'm a PhD student currently and I work with uh, Professor Lindsay Fletcher uh, on the applications of machine learning and solar physics. Uh, and so this is a topic that has interested me since I started and so I decided to volunteer today to speak about it. Okay, so uh, to start off, just a quick overview. I'm going, uh, hopefully I'll only speak for about 30 minutes or so and then hopefully we can have quite an interesting discussion afterwards. Um, but originally what I, I'm going to talk about is what transfer learning actually is, how it works, uh, why it should be getting used in solar physics, and uh, this concept that I've had of what I've called the solar image net and whether or not that is feasible and something that we might, as a community, actually want to do. Uh, so to get started straight off, uh, I would like to give a very, very brief review of deep learning. Uh, and so I'm sure you heard it all from Andres the last time. Uh, but I would just like to say that a deep neural network, uh, which is what we'll be assuming is the machine learning algorithm we'll be using pretty much all throughout uh, this talk, uh, is just a, a neural network where there is more than one hidden layer. So your input and your output are both layers. Uh, and then the layers in the middle uh, that do all the linear algebra and the non-linearity are hidden layers. So a deep network is one that has more than one of them. Uh, and then you've got traditional deep neural networks, which you've probably heard of, such as convolutional neural networks and artificial neural networks. They are built to perform one of two tasks. So they either do a classification or a regression, sometimes in a more complex manner than would seem obvious, but that is essentially what the two of those do. Uh, and if you're looking for anything more, to do anything more uh, complex, uh, to look into generation of data and uh, other stuff like that, you have to use something more complicated because these architectures can't actually cope uh, with doing a task like that. Uh, and so for that, you would look at using a variational autoencoder or a generative adversarial network, which is uh, the VAs and the GANs that are listed down at the bottom. <clears throat> so that's my very, very quick overview of deep learning. Uh, just keep in mind that we'll be mainly talking about uh, neural networks with more than one hidden layer uh, and so they can pick out uh, high level features. Okay, so what exactly is uh, transfer learning? So transfer learning uh, is just a, a technique where you take uh, a machine learning algorithm, made, uh, usually a neural network, that has learned a specific task. Uh, and what you do uh, is you use this to pass, uh, you use it, uh, what they say is to pass knowledge to a new model. And the way that I, and so what this really means is you take the values that you've optimized for one specific task and you use that to uh, influence the learning in another task. Uh, so essentially, you're kind of using the parameters from one neural network to uh, uh, to help uh, initialize uh, a second. And so essentially, it's uh, it most akin to a, a sort of optimization tool that uh, allows you to speed up training uh, in a new neural network. Uh, and so you can speed up training uh, you can improve the initialization. So if you are trying to minimize some loss function on a very highly dimensional uh, vector space, uh, then you can start in a better position if you uh, employ transfer learning. And there has also been 
uh, increased accuracy when people have used transfer learning as well. So uh, what this looks like graphically uh, is this. And so if we have uh, this is just a cartoon performance against training. And so uh, if you look at the points that are highlighted here, the higher start would correspond to having a good initialization. So you're starting in a better place in the loss space. And so you've got, uh, you're going to have better performance from the beginning. The higher slope uh, comes from the reduced, reduced training time. And so you're going to converge to your solution quicker. Uh, and the higher asking tool corresponds to an increased accuracy. Uh, and that would be that you would hope that your transfer learning would uh, increase uh, what your results are uh, in the end. And so that's kind of, these are the, the hopes, the aims of what we would get out of uh, employing transfer learning. Uh, and so uh, to fully understand how this might be, we will need to look at how it actually works. Uh, but <laughs> before that, I forgot to put this in. Uh, so uh, a bit more about neural networks just before we continue. Uh, so neural networks are examples of what's known as super supervised learning, which is when uh, you have your model, uh, uh, you, sorry, you have your architecture and it learns a model based on a set of labeled training examples. Uh, so you know what the answers are. Uh, for all of your training data before you begin training. Uh, and to generate a model like this, uh, we need to have some kind of bias. Uh, we need to have some sort of assumptions about what the true distribution of the training data actually is, so that we can then uh, minimize the distance of how far away we are from this idealized probability distribution uh, of the training set and this uh, gives us the model uh, for the neural network. So this is described by what's called the loss function, which is just uh, the distance between uh, the true value, uh, the, the neural network uh, function applied to the data and the, uh, uh, and the model, uh, uh, the uh, assumed true distribution uh, applied to the training data. And this is also uh, you, uh, this is also described a bit by initialization uh, as well. Um, sorry. Uh, so the uh, depending on a uh, you can assume some kind of model of where you are most likely to start in uh, your multi-dimensional loss space, which is something that is a big topic of research, uh, and there has been. Uh, a few attempts at trying to constrain the best place to start. Um, so an example of a, the bias coming from the loss function is this thing called the L2 loss, which is essentially the Euclidean distance between uh, the neural network applied to the data and the uh, ideal, the true distribution that you've assumed. Uh, so the Euclidean distance between them on some, uh, in some space uh, actually arises if you follow if you follow through Bayes' theorem, this isn't really important, it's just more of an aside, but if you follow through Bayes' theorem uh, and uh, you arrive at the conclusion that to, max, uh, to minimize the loss, you also need to minimize the negative log likelihood of, uh, uh, of your training data model. So uh, if you assume that training data model is a Gaussian, you end up with uh, a loss function to minimize that is the L2 loss. Uh, and you can sort of, you can derive that fairly easily, but it's not what this is about. Uh, this is more just uh, the important thing here is that uh, the model needs some kind of bias, and it's this bias that we're going to try and influence with our transfer learning. So, how does transfer learning actually work? Uh, so, uh, if uh, so, the transfer learning will only work. Uh, if the features learned by the first model are general and related to the new model that you're trying to train. So you can take, for instance, uh, a neural network that knew what a cat looked like and uh, apply it to another neural network 
that you're trying to look for features in the sun because that's not going to help <laughs> at all. Uh, so that's a so it needs to be something that's general and it needs to be something that's related. Uh, uh, so uh, essentially, how it works is that uh, transferring knowledge, say, uh, constrains the parameter space. And so, if we look at the the image at the bottom, uh, for just normal learning, you have a a subset of every single conceivable hypothesis. Uh, or every single conceivable model, you have a subset of that as the models that your network can learn based on a uh, based on the bias that you've applied to it. Uh, and when you do uh, and when you transfer information from a previous network, this constrains this base of models even further and can uh, aid the search for the right model. And I think that's supposed to be illustrated by the fact that there's more arrows on the left than on the right and it's because you get to the you get to uh, you converge to the solution quicker uh, so i it's a bit of a hand wavy uh explanation of how it works uh essentially you come up with some way to uh get your neural network that uh to learn from another neural network before it started learning itself, usually. Uh, and so this is uh, the two main ways that it's used. Uh, so it can be used in the initialization, which I have uh, said, uh, which I have said before. Uh, essentially, uh, a lot of the time when you create a neural network from scratch, the uh, the weights for the parameters between different bits of the network are just randomized to, uh, or just initialized to some random value from some random distribution. Uh, and so what you can do, uh, so one way to employ transfer learning is to actually take, uh, to directly take the, the uh, parameters from one neural network that's related to yours uh, and uh, set them as the initial values because uh, if you're saying that two topics are related and some n-dimensional loss space, uh, if, if two things are closely related, then you starting from the position of one of them is going to be closer to the solution for the other. Uh, it's going to be closer than if you start randomly in that space, for instance. And so one way to do this is to use train parameters from one network uh, and initialize it, use that as the initialization of the other. The other way is uh, in the loss, uh, in the loss function. Uh, so the, in the loss function itself, the uh, choice that you make for that, the choice that you make for your distribution data might be influenced by what. Yeah, so this isn't really a way that you transfer knowledge between the networks. It's more you being the middleman for transferring uh, the knowledge in the sense that in the loss function, uh, if you have a network uh, with a specific task, uh, you can then say, oh, well, if I've got this related task, I know that it should, uh, it's more likely for uh, the distribution of the training data to be this, and so I should choose this loss function to try and minimize the set. Uh, and, uh, and the third way, which is kind of in brackets, which we'll talk a bit about later, is that the loss function can actually take information directly from the previous network and use this uh, to learn, but this is a very uh, complicated, uh, uh, a very complicated system that uh, uh, hasn't been used too much and is still in a lot of research. Uh, warning before you think that it's uh, all amazing that you can just uh, take a neural network and get better performance by getting information from some other neural network. So there is a thing called negative transfer and this uh, can actually cause the performance of the network to decrease. And this is uh, uh, so sometimes when you do knowledge transfer, uh, you end up with the opposite of the desired effect, uh, and this can be uh, 
simply because uh, the previous network uh, was not actually very related to the new network in the way that you thought it might have been. And so it's actually uh, got a detriment to its learning. And this can cause a uh, uh, the, the, yeah, so the, uh, as I said, this can cause a decrease in the performance. Uh, and uh, it has been shown that eventually your network with negative transfer will get back up to the accuracy it would if you never done transfer at all, but it will never surpass that because you started off from an even worse position uh, than if you had just randomized it initially. So uh, an example of this is if we drain something in your network to look for features, uh, on the sun, say, uh, some optical wavelength. Uh, and then we said, okay, let's take some solar x-ray data. Uh, we want to make a network out of this. We want to look for uh, hard x-ray foot points or whatever. Uh, and you said, oh, I'll just uh, transfer knowledge from my optical network. Uh, that actually would almost certainly not work because the features look nothing the same in the two different uh, wave bands of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And so this would be something that would probably cause negative transfer. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of uh, something that seems like it could be related, but actually it's really not. Uh, so moving on, we've got uh, a couple of examples of uh, transfer learning. So a couple of ways that it actually works. So the first one on the left is the Bayesian trans uh, transfer. And uh, in Bayesian learning techniques, the prior distribution uh, uh, strongly affects the posterior distribution that you get. And so if you transfer some new prior distribution from a network that knows, uh, a network that knows about the task that you're trying to accomplish, then uh, you can actually improve the calculations of the posterior distribution. Uh, and uh, get better results. And so, uh, and the other one, which I think is the most intuitive example, is a uh, hierarchical, hierarchical transfer. Uh, and essentially, this is when you take the solutions to simple tasks and you combine them or provide them as tools to make them solutions for more complex tasks. And so, you could uh, have a neural network. If we take the example that's on the slide, you could have a neural network that uh, was trained to draw pipes, for instance, uh, but uh, or trained to recognise pipes even. Uh, but uh, that's quite a complex task because a pipe is a, a, a three-dimensional object and uh, it's complex as opposed to something, say, like a line or a curve. Uh, and so the way to overcome this, rather than just dropping your neural network at your neural network in the dark and saying, "Oh, learn how to do this," because that could take a really long time, you can have other neural networks: one that learns what lines are, one that learns what curves are, and you can combine them to learn about surfaces and circles, uh, which you can then combine the two of them, uh, and it's uh, to learn about a pipe. And so, uh, sort of the even though this involves having more neural networks in general, uh, the, I guess sort of the, the takeaway from this is that everything below pipe, uh, below the pipe neural network, will probably already exist as a pre trained model somewhere so that you can actually just learn about uh, a pipe uh, more quickly because uh, someone hopefully we'll already have done a neural network for a line, a curve, a circuit, and a circle. Uh, and so you don't need to do all the hierarchy yourself, uh, but getting uh, uh, information from the uh, further down the hierarchy and the neural networks will be helpful. So that's two examples of uh, transfer learning and how you might implement it. Uh, and this is an example that desperately needs transfer, which I thought was quite funny. Uh, essentially, someone's hosting a dinner party and gets their neural network to make dinner. Uh, and it's terrible, shockingly, because it's not had enough time to train to know what a recipe is. And so it might benefit from uh, 
having to transfer learning to uh, from some other neural network that knows recipes or knows how to not keep try skills. Um, so that's just a sort of uh, interlude into uh, the second half of my talk that is uh, how we can do uh, how we can actually use this uh, in solar physics. Uh, and so it just brings me on to my next point of why it's needed in solar physics. Uh, let's check in the um, So there's a, there's a bunch of reasons here. Um, uh, but I think the uh, I think the main one, uh, uh, the main well, the main two are that it encourages collaboration because uh, then you could have someone who's got a model that you think might benefit from your model, learning from it, uh, and so it gets people talking, etc. Uh, and it can also allow people to train models without needing supercomputer resources. So sometimes your neural networks are big, uh, and you have so much data and it's high resolution and so you need essentially servers to compute it and uh, and GPU servers at that which are not as common as they <laughs> are not as common as uh, they might be in a few years if more people start doing uh, machine learning uh, and so I think these are the two main things to focus on and it's, uh, why it would be good for uh, people to look to employing transfer learning if they're looking at uh, applying some kind of deep neural network to their uh, solar physics problem. Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to talk now about I, a bit about the work that I uh, have been doing uh, and how uh, I'm currently uh, using transfer learning in uh, solar physics. So the first thing uh, isn't actually uh, to do with transfer learning, but uh, uh, so the first thing that I've done is uh, to create uh, a deep convolutional neural network that uh, recognizes features in the sun trained on an ODH alpha data. Uh, and so this can uh, look for a number of uh, sort of basic structures like uh, clear ribbons and prominences and sunspots and what have you. Uh, and in this, uh, where I have assumed that filaments and prominences are actually different things because they look different geometrically, even though they're the same, but it shouldn't matter for the implementation of this because I. Uh, but anyway, so this is a, a essentially this is an image of uh, a prominent uh, NH alpha that my network has never seen before. Uh, and you pass it through the, the deep neural network and it thinks it's a problem and that's great. So uh, we have taught this uh, we have taught this network what the sun looks like. We've, uh, it understands what these features look like. And, uh, and so this, this may not be insanely useful by itself but it has massive potential in a transfer learning capability. Uh, in a sense, uh, in the sense of what I'm about to talk about next, uh, and so uh, this is for uh, something else that I've been working on, which is not uh, at its best state right now. But this is uh, correcting for being in flares using what's called the generative ad adversarial network, or a GAN, uh, which is uh, essentially you have two different deep neural networks and they play a game against each other uh, and they train each other. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, so the the reason I, I so I started doing this a while ago uh, just because there was some data I was working with and thought that if I could restore the data and learn how to remove, uh, not remove, correct. <laughs> Sunday when I ask as well. Okay, I'll just do one. Um, uh, so the uh, to correct uh, as a way for correcting for seeing in my flare data as uh, 
we don't really have a lot of data on flares, so it would be nice to be able to reuse them. Uh, and so essentially the image of the sun on the left is one with uh, an artificial uh, seeing model imprinted on it, and the one on the right is the one that the network has uh, generated to be free of seeing. And uh, we've got a couple of the uh, emission and absorption spectra there to show uh, how well it performs, which is not the best and should improve with better training uh, with access to resources. And also, uh, the, the point and what I've been talking about is the way that transfer learning is employed. Uh, so something that will be happening soon, I just haven't implemented yet, will be to uh, use the previous neural network to understand what the sun looks like. Uh, uh, or what some of the features of the sun look like in H alpha and use this uh, I use this knowledge uh, and transfer learn it to this network to hopefully start it uh, in a better place so that we get good convergence and get better results. Uh, and so the, the point in this is that GANs in general are really difficult to train. Uh, and so any help we can get in initialization will uh, help. And so how exactly will we do this? Uh, is through this wonderful equation that is the only equation in my talk, I promise. Uh, it's called the perceptual law. Uh, and so essentially we take our pre-trained, uh, uh, we take our pre-trained uh, CNN that recognizes features on the sun, uh, and we go to some very deep layer, and we take the, uh, we essentially take uh, the, convolutional kernel that has been trained to recognize features of the sun and we apply that as a function to uh, what the true image looks like and what the uh, what the generator of the GAN generates to be uh, uh, an image uh, to be a true image to be an image that is free of seeing and so Essentially, what this it, what this does is because you have some convolutional kernel that knows uh, what features from the sun look like, uh, and it's large scale features because you take it from a deep layer in the neural network. Uh, you essentially are uh, minimizing a distance between. Uh, this is uh, it's a very complicated thing that I, don't, I still don't quite understand, but you're essentially trying to minimize the distance between uh, the convolution of uh, something that will pick out uh, something that uh, knows about the sun and the sharp image and the convolution of something that knows about the sun and the generated image. And so the closer you bring those two together, uh, the more likely it is for your image to your generated image to look like the sun. Uh, and so the reason this is called perceptual loss is because it produces perceptual uh, images, uh, images that actually look like the sun. So you could get other loss functions that would say they had converged, but you would look at the image and it would be nothing like the, what you need it to look like. And so this uh, is something that, uh, this is a way to use transfer learning to possibly uh, both, uh, to possibly boost uh, the perceptiveness of the image and also the accuracy of the conversion. Um, yeah, so that's how I've uh, or am planning to uh, implement transfer learning into my work. Uh, so the next, the, so the last thing I'd like to talk about on a couple more slides. I'm sorry, I'm talking for a really long time. Um, is uh, something that I have termed solar image net. Uh, and so anyone who has done any sort of deep learning stuff before has almost definitely heard of image net. This is the largest collection of images in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there's millions of images and they're sorted into thousands. I think there's like 4,000 or something classes. Uh, and there's competitions every so often where people come up with new deep neural network architectures uh, and train it on this uh, big database of images uh, 
and then uh, see who gets the best conversion, which is really hard to do because there are so many images and so many classes. Uh, and essentially the way it works is that you then after that, when you have people looking to try a new deep learning model or something, because there are so many different uh, classes of image within ImageNet, uh, that's the best place to uh, use transfer learning because uh, to, or to transfer knowledge from, uh, because it understands uh, what so many different things look like, because it's uh, such a big database essentially. Um, and so uh, people use that to initialize their models, especially like, uh, I mean, it depends. It depends what their project is, but uh, plenty of people uh, initialize their new neural networks with uh, a pre-trained network that has been trained on ImageNet, uh, and you can take uh, sort of a, a subset of the parameters that they get, the ones that you think are the most useful, and you can use that to initialize your network, and uh, it has less about better conversion uh, and a lot of uh, different, uh, a lot of different uh, projects. Uh, for instance, like the perceptual loss that I was speaking about previously, uh, the uh, a, a original people who uh, came up with that, uh, they use, because they are dealing with uh, real world images, as opposed to pictures of the sun or whatever, uh, they uh, transfer learn from ImageNet, and this gives them, uh, and this is what led them to deriving this loss function and seeing that it gives them better convergence uh, in networks where it was applied. Uh, so my idea, is for a solar image net, and that's because, not so shockingly, uh, the previous deep convolutional neural network that I showed that learned some features of the sun uh, uh, in H-alpha cannot identify those same features in uh, different wavelengths for a variety of reasons, and that's not entirely at all surprising. That it can't do that, um, purely based on the fact that a uh, different uh, bands in the electromagnetic spectrum look different. They emit differently. They emit in different places, etc. But uh, yeah, but they, these were tests that I carried out just uh, to sort of try and make a case that we should have something like a big. Uh, database of solar images across the electromagnetic spectrum uh, and train a big CNN. And then we could have one source for uh, most of our transfer learning needs. And it could be something that could be uh, something that we all do together. But I'll get on to the uh, recruiting stage or the preachy stage in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so essentially, this is the image shows the prominence uh, and uh, helium 2 from AIA, which uh, does not even slightly get classified uh, like it should uh, by the network, which uh, I have uh, deemed to be uh, due to the fact that you get uh, pixelated helium-2 emissions uh, higher up uh, in the uh, corona, whereas if you looked at the same prominence in H-alpha, it would be uh, pretty much completely black behind the prominence. And so that's why I think the network gets confused. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so the idea uh, is to create a sort of image net type thing, but for uh, solar images. Uh, but there's always questions about feasibility and so forth. So like, can we actually do this? So uh, the deep CNN that I've got is trained on 13,000 plus different images of the sun in H alpha from you know, the SOT. And that took me probably uh, longer than it, uh, longer than I should have spent on it to download all of those images and to augment them and to classify them. Because the thing is, is this is the supervised learning task. But before we do the training, we need to manually classify all of these images. And that's what I had to do. Um, and so if we're looking at doing millions of images into hundreds or thousands of different classes, it's 
a lot of time. Uh, one solution to this that I've thought about is that it's possible to do, it might be possible to do a sort of citizen science thing where we classify a bunch of different ones by ourselves, uh, set up some kind of website and say, oh, uh, this is what a sunspot looks like in uh, some visible wavelengths, I don't know, <laughs> wavelengths escape me. Uh, this is what a prominence looks like in blah, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then tell people, oh, here's this image, what does this look like? And they can go through and do it. The only problem with that is you need to try and make it sound interesting and enough, but it might be something, unless we can get a bunch of undergraduate minions to download millions of images for us, but that might not be possible. Um, the, the other slight problem is that if you have a network that gets trained on millions of images, you will with undoubtedly need Supercomputing resources uh, and possibly weeks of training. And so that can uh, be something that can be very costly uh, and another yeah. sort of example. John, but, just, yeah. I, John, I have a question. Why do you say um, we probably need millions of solar images? Do you think that, the, so in ImageNet, they, they indeed need the millions of uh, images because, I mean, the world can be very. Uh, I mean, there is a large variability, but in the sun, probably we don't need millions. I don't know, but that's that's only a feeling. I don't. Uh, well, maybe millions might be a bit of a stretch. I would think that at least uh, we would need hundreds of thousands. Uh, in my yeah. opinion, I I could I reckon that if you're looking uh, at a lot a range of different wavelengths, you would be able to come up with. Uh, at least a few hundred different classes that you could classify images into. And so mm -hmm. I think maybe millions was a bit ambitious of me, but even uh, a few hundred thousand would still be a lot of uh, data and a lot of time spent to uh, do this. Do you, hi, John, this is Hazel. Do you have a, a sense whether um, that many images exist in the solar sort of archives? Because even if you look at like the, um, it, let's just say you're looking at Instagram data or something like the images, the sun doesn't change quick enough, right? Like the thing about the image net is like, you can like birds naturally appear in different, <laughs> in different like orientations or whatever, but like an active region doesn't necessarily change enough from like hour to hour, maybe from day to day, we could look at that. But like in some ways you're almost adding redundancy into the, into the, into those, uh, like uh, yeah, that, that was my point. Event. Yeah. That was my point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's that, that's a really good point, and that's something that I have uh, tried to manually do with the uh, the CNN that I've trained myself. Is that I look for so, for instance, these with sunspots. I didn't take three thousand images where it was all just images with just one singular sunspot, roughly in the same point on the image. It, like I, I looked for ones that had multiple sunspots and uh, and different locations of the image and stuff like that. And so it's something that redundancy is a problem that might occur, especially with magnetogram data, I guess. But I think it would. I don't know. I, I don't. Essentially, I'm not sure if enough variable data exists for the type of images that I'm talking. I just done quick back of the envelope calculations of. Uh, how much data is stored in like uh, the SDO databases and uh, the Hinozi database and stuff like that and came up with a figure that probably wasn't very thought through. Oh, I mean, I don't think we're questioning the, <laughs> the yeah. not thought through. I mean, I think it's definitely something to, to think about doing and it would be great to have some sort of resource that's like that. The other thing is like the augmentation, like again, with like birds or cars or boats or something, you can kind of augment the image without that really changing something fundamental about the thing that you're trying to identify. With the, with the solar stuff, it gets a little weird. Like, is there something, I mean, in theory, you could take an active region and move it anywhere in the sun, but, but that's, are we changing something fundamental about why that active region is the way it is based on where it is on the sun or the orientation of it with respect to sort of the polar north or something? Like, we almost don't even have the full ability to do all the augmentation that we'd want to do it is kind of my feeling i don't know what your feeling on that is uh yeah i yeah i agree with that um 
I, I had never really thought about the augmentation from uh, uh, from that aspect of it of moving different things about the sun and uh, purely based out of the fact because uh, I don't know. So I think I think if you're looking at uh, images of the sun, if it's uh, you could hypothetically do something that would generate an image that would look like the sun, but there's no way for it to actually, it, unless you have all the physics down or uh, have a really good model, there's no way for you to see that that image is actually an image of the sun. But to a neural network, I guess that doesn't really make a difference. And so we would have to think about how it's augmented because otherwise we could just generate all the data we wanted, but it might not actually be useful in a scientific concept, context. That yeah, I, I definitely see what you mean. I guess it depends on what the question is. If you're doing like feature recognition, maybe it's not such a big deal. But like if you're trying to learn something about like, I don't know, flare forecasting, um, then things yeah. that you would naturally do to augment the image to sort of add more um, variation to your database of stored events, like kind of what they do with, you know, with the boats, you can, you can, you can flip the image, what like vertically or horizontally or whatever. And well, maybe not horizontally, that doesn't make sense for a boat, but <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like you can change the way the image is viewed so you can sort of artificially make your uh, database of images larger. I just yeah. question about whether we can do that like with when so much of the stuff that we're looking at might have a scientific reason for it being orientated the way it is or, uh, you know, being, but yeah, all those kind of things. And that's that's difficult. Unfortunately, we don't have the full ability to to do those things. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's definitely so that it's actually something that I uh, took into account as well with the deep CNN that I've trained. It's just that uh, I I didn't feel comfortable adding in those sort of random locations or color changes or whatever because uh, well, I mean we've only got one channel images anyway, but I I yeah because I was trying to preserve as much of the physics as I could in the feature recognition. I didn't want to randomly move it about or randomly spin it around to uh, an angle uh, and I guess that probably would cause a problem uh, in redundancy because the whole point in that is to try and stop the network from overfitting but if you have uh, a large proportion of your uh, images uh, uh, looking the same then it's going to think that uh, all of that one feature just looks like that even if there's uh, ten percent of like interesting cases because there's ninety percent that all look the same. So yeah, I think that's something we would need to look for unique images as well, uh, which would take even longer, I guess, because <laughs> you know you need to look through all the data sets instead of just uh, downloading them. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I'll continue unless anyone else has questions. That's okay, I have a question. If that's okay, yeah. do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so there is a, an actual question and the, and one favor that I have to ask. The actual question is uh, perhaps a bit trivial, and you were talking about this uh, sort of sharpening or uh, in a way image reconstruction from for the flares. So, yeah. do you have any quantitative um, estimate on how much can you improve resolution by using the neural network? Uh, so I, I don't right now, so it's uh, not really something that I have been, uh, I've been sort of uh, sidetracked from that project recently and so the uh, the results are more qualitative at the moment uh, and I'm still looking to employ methods to get quantitative results but uh, super resolution is definitely something that you can do uh, and has been done by Andrew on uh, HMI Magnetogram. So you could uh, look for that paper if you're looking for uh, sure. sort of quantitative measure, uh, measurement. Uh, but uh, as of right now, I've not got any. I apologize. Okay. I just thought it uh, looked good. Sure. And the, and the favor is the following one. Uh, so as we as we discussed last time, we want to in the next few weeks or a month to pre to prepare some. Uh, very simple illustrative examples for people so that they could uh, get started with neural networks. 
Yeah. And I think that uh, the example that you mentioned with Bayesian inference with different priors influencing the posterior is something that is of interest to many people here in the in the in the meeting. So yeah, yeah. could we maybe I mean if you can do it on your own it would be great but I mean we can also collaborate and maybe prepare some simple simple example of that because I think it would be super useful for people to to be able to employ something like that in their research. Yeah, definitely that would be something that we could definitely look at doing. I can have a look into doing it and we can have a chat about it. Uh okay. so I can uh put my email address back up at the end of the uh uh, at the end of the talk and you can drop me uh, uh, an email about doing that and I'd be happy to help in any way. Okay, great. Uh, Sebastian here from MPS also has a question. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, one wants to do a like classification for your idea, but why if we started with a classification that is already done, I don't know, for like, for example, for sun expo sun response, like, the Zurich classification or something like that, to start with something that we already know that there are these type of sunny spots and then you can, one can try to, to um, from something that is already classified, then start the, the thousand of millions of solar images, but so from, from a basic, not to start all, all the, all the one, 100 times hours worth, you know? Because it, it yeah. is already done. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, definitely. But I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's true that we could uh, start. Hey, sorry, were you asking if we could start from somewhere where we already know and try to classify more complex objects? Is that what you were getting at? Or? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the. Yeah, that they that's definitely something that can be done, and it's definitely some a uh, possibly the uh, it's the most common use of uh, transfer learning is to do exactly that, and it's that uh, a uh, people uh, so people take uh, a neural network that's been trained to classify a bunch of stuff, but they want to cl classify something a bit more complex, but something that's related, uh, and uh, the so they use that previous neural network to initialize this new one. And that is something that you can do, uh, and it generally ends up being a lot quicker for it to learn uh, the structures that you're looking for and stuff like that. So yeah, it has been done, and it could be done. Uh, so the the reason for me bringing up the hundreds of thousands of images or whatever is just to uh, something that would be uh, a nice thing to have, especially. Uh, uh, as a nice collaborative thing, but also uh, it could be a very useful tool as well if it's something that would actually work for our case. But it's not really uh, been investigated to the fullest. Well, no, I, it's the sort of an idea that I've had for a while, but I'm not entirely sure if uh, it would be feasible. In, in fact, the people from uh, the Zooniverse, they, they were in charge of the Galaxy Zoo. Um, yeah. a survey they also had a sun spotter uh, and i think they would, they wanted to uh, classify um, sunspots if i'm not mistaken and according to the web page mm, they classified like 5 million uh, images of sunspots so yeah. that's something i mean that's something to consider uh, to uh, keep in contact with these people of the zoo of the uh, universe and then, because they, they have several classifications online now, so it's, it's just a matter of uh, having a good data set of images of many different regions in the sun and then just uh, outsource yeah. that to these people. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We, yeah. yeah, we're having a look, uh, have been having a look at uh, that kind of stuff as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good, good idea. Okay, um, yeah, it's an inverse with my sort of thought for that kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, so. There's also a project that's, that's ongoing here at, uh, at NOAA. Um, uh, Dan Seaton has a student called Marcus Hughes. They're about to publish a paper on, on this topic where they're trying to do 
uh, a thematic map of uh, the sun using SUVI images. So it's doing things spectrally, um, which they kind of already know is not like the the best way to classify uh, pixels on the sun that really need, they need to go down a CNN route. But this was with the, the project had a very specific um, question. Could you um, identify regions on the sun using the spectral pixel information from SUVI? So like that was just the goal of the project. And this is going to be the results of that. But based on, on their work and also on the work by like Josh Riggler and a few other different people who have kind of tried to look at that like for this, you don't need to, so the big problem that Marcus has had is with the training data is like trying to um, really get clean training data. Uh, I mean, he certainly has a tool that you can go around and like uh, highlight which portions of, this, of the sun you associate with like a prominence or with a filament or a flare or a quiet sun or whatever. And we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, we must be, we might not be doing the edges of those, um, of masking out where those features are particularly well, like the, particularly with like prominence, uh, particularly with filaments and the quiet sun, it's really difficult to tell those two things apart because you're getting quiet sun um, emission in, in, the pro in the filament. Um, but it's just something to think about, like the, if that gets up and running, um, that could be run on a back catalog of like things like SUVI or AIA or things like this. And whilst it might give you kind of like not a perfect pixel by pixel score, it might be good for being able to pull out like a particular active region. Like if you just want to have like, um, say like a box around some kind of feature and you know that inside that box there is a flare or a prominence or a, or a filament or something, this might be able to be kind of a starting point for something like that. So that's also something to look out for that might be interesting for you to look at. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That would be very interesting. I'll make sure that I look out for that paper when it's uh, out and about. Uh, thanks for, yeah, no, that would be very interesting. Sorry, I think we might be slightly running out of time. So, like, I have just closing thoughts. I think uh, this transfer learning might be something that would be useful to you. Watch out that you don't get negative transfer. Color image net, maybe a good idea. The only problem with that is we don't know uh, after it's already been done. And if it's not a good idea, then we've just wasted a bunch of time. So, <laughs> that's uh, another thing to think about. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. If there's any further questions or discussions or thoughts that people have, then feel free to chime in now. Uh, and I will just go back to start because I probably should have put my email address at the end. If you have any questions that you want to ask outside of this uh, webinar, feel free to email me or, uh, yeah, email me or uh, I mean, that's the only way I've really given you to contact me. Uh, yeah, so thanks for letting me speak about this for a while. Um, Thank you very much for the super nice talk. And I just want to, 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 to stress once again that we always need somebody to give the next talk. So I would just like to ask all the people to think about whether you would like the next meeting to be the regular talk as the ones that we did uh, for the first three meetings or you would actually enjoy some sort of tutorial or demonstration uh, for change. And um, yeah, basically that's, um, that's more or less all. So just think about these things and feel free to use the mailing list for uh, other things than just announcing our talks. So feel free to share anything, feel free to share your uh, GitHub repositories or whatever else you have. And yeah, I mean, if nobody, uh, uh, volunteers to give a talk for the two weeks from now, then I will probably send a doodle to ask you whether you want to have a talk or to have a demo or something like that. And yeah, anyway, yeah, that would be all. Does anybody else have any comments concerning the, the, the seminar itself? Okay. I, I I guess that's no. Yeah. So yeah, everybody everybody wants their Friday. I guess. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Sorry. This is the the only time I could do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Everyone should go enjoy their Friday. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. See you. See you in uh, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. And be, be active online.
Ciao.